This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. First, you can't keep your job because of COVID. Then you can't pay the rent because of COVID. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around. We'll tell you about the help that's available for renters and homeowners facing eviction and foreclosure. Plus, we'll meet the artist who created this. He takes us inside a studio and meet an innovative couple who found a way to perform during this COVID era. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. COVID changes how we live. It separates so many workers from their jobs and so many students from their schools. It takes the health and sometimes the lives of our loved ones. And for some families, COVID also changes where we live. That's what happens when you're out of work or sick from the virus or caring for your family and you can't pay the rent or the mortgage. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier joins us with more on recent evictions. Yeah, so how do you stay at home or work from home during COVID when you risk losing your home because of COVID? That's the dilemma for a lot of struggling families facing and fighting eviction because, you know, when the rent's due, what else can you do? Sheriff's office. It starts with a knock on your door. I was terrified then a lock on your door. Once well, these guys change these locks, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, you're leaving the property. This is what everybody is dealing with, so I went through the process. The eviction process, that means it may not be your door anymore. Chili Wider or any current tenants. So many people that are out of work, so many people that are in danger of losing their home, in danger of being homeless. That's why these eviction protesters are putting posters on their cars. We make this first right, the okay. first left at the light, okay. the courthouse is going to be on your left. Honking their horns as they circle the Mecklenburg County Courthouse, drawing rush hour attention to a problem that's personal to a lot of these protesters. Housing is a human right. to keep our family safe, our children safe. We just need somewhere where we can call home. We need to keep home home for right now. We cannot afford to go through an addiction and make everything worse. Nicole Curitan is outside the courthouse fighting to keep her house. And she's sharing her story publicly for the first time. My story is my landlord in the middle of this pandemic uh, decides that he wants to sell the property that we're living on. Six months ago, a year ago, did you ever think you'd be in this position? I had, I, I could never imagine being in this, in this situation, never ever. The same thing we are asking is two times anything 23. Before COVID, Curitan's three kids were in school every day, and she was at work every day. But now the kids' classroom is a kitchen table. Six divided by two equals one. And Curitan's a single mom on a leave of absence from her paying job. I made the choice to, you know, stay home and make sure they don't fall behind. For a parent, it's an easy choice, but it's an awfully hard choice, too. It is. Yeah. It's very hard. Everything is just turned upside down. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. You know, I have to get them used to a whole new schedule, mm -hmm. a, no, a whole new way of living, a lot of sleepless nights, mm. you know, wondering, trying to figure out, you know, what step is next mm -hmm. and what's the best step for my family. And as all her unpaid bills pile up, as all her old neighbors move out from the now deserted mobile home park, that for sale sign on the property line makes Curitan feel like she's running out of options. I have no way of knowing mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. That's the hardest part, I suppose. Is not knowing, mm -hmm. very hard. Housing is a human right, housing is a human right. 
Eviction protest organizer April Lewis has been there too, facing her own eviction back in March. And she says those moratoriums on COVID evictions have helped. To make it where people can actually not have to worry about housing or where they're going to live at to be able to handle a weather the storm. But moratoriums aren't forever. And what out of work renters and homeowners really need is, you know, cash. Where the money gonna come from? Cause the bill is coming. Nicole Anthony is proud of her house, proud of her family, but not too proud to know that she needed some help making the mortgage. We got our last check in June, so July was really scary for me, just figuring out what we're going to do with nothing's opening and, and the bills was rolling in. Yeah, mortgage and lights and water. I know that they said that they had, I guess, a work out a plan, but I was like, no, because when the plan is over, that money is still due. And then Anthony got this letter in the mail. Have you experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19? About a program that could help her make the mortgage and make up for that lost COVID income. So glad that I was introduced to it and you don't pay it back. Mm -hmm. And they pay your mortgage for you. That's got to be a huge uh, relief. Huge relief. You earned this house. Yes, sir. You deserve to keep this house. Yes, sir. And this program lets you do that. And let me do it. They did, so that's one good thing. COVID or no COVID? COVID or no COVID, I get to keep it. Yeah, nice to hear a success story with so many struggling against foreclosure and eviction, but the uh, renters and the homeowners that we've talked with all say that keeping your home during COVID is a fight worth fighting, especially when you don't have to fight that fight alone. Amy. Thanks so much, Jeff. As you just heard in his story, if you're facing eviction or foreclosure, there is help available. The Charlotte Mecklenburg Housing Partnership is working with the city and the county to help you pay your overdue rent or mortgage. Here's some additional information from Housing Partnership President Julie Porter. People who are vulnerable are much more vulnerable right now. And the pandemic has hit people differently if they are low income um, or if they are middle income, especially with the pandemic. They've never asked for help before and suddenly they're having to. The degree of difficulty and all the stuff we thought was simple or easy is just, you know. Suddenly people are gonna be faced with bills of, you know, eight, 10, $15,000. And if they don't have any way to pay it, the evictions are just going to come in an avalanche. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just set up for a tsunami, you know, so that's, it, it becomes infinitely more difficult for a city to try to administer anything like this. You talked about moratorium basically buying time for the renter. I guess it also buys time for the government to figure out how they can provide more resources. Well, the good thing is if people have had some kind of a COVID related hardship, whether that's a job loss, a wage reduction, um, maybe illness or a childcare issue, they are subject to this moratorium, which basically means that if they fill out the correct paperwork and get it to the right people, that eviction is stopped. It's not a free pass, but it does offer some relief for folks who are facing eviction or, or housing challenges. I think one of the real issues with the moratorium that I'm worried about is that it doesn't stop rent. You know, rent is still accumulating. You know, you get them through this. If we get people through this, most likely they will go right back to paying their mortgage, paying their rent every single month. And what we need to do is make sure that they have that access to that help. These are grants? These are grants. They don't have to be paid back. They do not have to be paid back. All the different things that we have to go through sometimes in order to help one person, at the end, they are so grateful. And they're like, well, they all hesitate to ask for help because they've never needed it before, especially in this case. And they should have absolutely no qualms about applying for it. Thanks, Julie. You can find more information on the RAMP program at our website, pbscharlotte.org. Well, do you remember the Million Man March in Washington, D.C. back in the 90s? Thousands marched to promote African-American unity and family values. When some of those marchers came home to Charlotte, they wanted to help our community, and one program really took off. 
Carolina Impact's B. Thompson has the details. So we will harvest the green tomatoes, we'll get in teams, and we're gonna harvest okra. What's going on here is more than just the harvesting of a garden. It's also the growing of young men in the community. But how does a garden and a community help a boy as he transitions into becoming a man? This idea began with a gathering of black men in Washington, D.C. Some of the, uh, the actionable items that came out of the Million Man March was they said, go back home, go back into your community and mentor our boys. I watch my thoughts, they become my words. I watch my words, they become my actions. That was the start of the Males Place, a program designed to aid young black boys dealing with everyday issues of growing up and issues specifically impacting African-American males. There are a lot of distractions, and many of those distractions are intentional. The things that are put in media, the things, barriers that people are uh, encountering in the education system. One of the things we like to do is make sure that we're an asset to the community. So in doing so, we want to look for opportunities to do good. They gather weekly to not only tend the garden and harvest vegetables, but to gather and focus on topics from history to career exploration. They listen to guest speakers who focus on issues young men are struggling with on a daily basis, from single parent homes, to school, to white supremacy. Lift every voice and sing. A warrior power word for the week is philosophy of life. Each week during their group sessions, they share their experiences in helping to make someone else's life better. My positive experience for the week was helping my cousin celebrate her birthday by bringing her some of the things we grew in our garden. My positive experience is bringing up the bags from my mother. My aunt had a virus on a computer and I helped her eliminate it. The men who mentor these boys say growing this garden is one way to show them how life and the lessons they learn now can impact them. So that's a metaphorical of how their lives are and when they need to be handled with care and when they're allowed to just go out and be in the world. So uh, we try to pour into them just as the nurture and the, the learning that they get in this, this garden will help them to offer that outside of this garden and into the community. As for these young men, they get it. The most place program for me is just a way for black boys to learn everything that, learn a lot of things that you wouldn't learn in school. So how to be a responsible black man. Self-control, uh, how I do things, more leadership, uh, discipline definitely, how to just keep with the schedule, and yeah, respect who has already passed for me. They've traveled regionally to Selma, Birmingham, Charleston and Washington, and internationally to the continent of Africa and to Cuba. More than 3,000 young men have come through this program, including Carlos, who started as a mentee in the 90s and came back to be a mentor in the new millennium. To be able to uh, relate to where they're at, um, even though it's 2000s, you know, and I went to school in the 90s, they deal with a whole lot more um, on a social level that we didn't quite have to deal with. Um, it's a lot more pressure, a lot more peer pressure, uh, a lot more things that they can get into um, with the internet and all this uh, social media. The harvest for the young men this year has been great. The proceeds from selling garden veggies at the Rosa Parks Farmer's Market pay for their educational trips, and they provide free veggies to the community members. The completion of their journey is a rites of passage into manhood ceremony. For those who put forth the effort to train up these young men, why do it? It's important that we make a contribution toward bringing freedom, toward bringing liberation, toward bringing dignity and honor to our people. Such an important goal for such vital work. With the faith of a mustard seed, a harvest will grow, not just in a garden, but in the community. For Carolina Impact, I'm B. Thompson.
Thanks so much, B. The Males Place Mentoring Program meets weekly with a focus on community agriculture and social justice. COVID-19 has impacted just about everybody's life. Perhaps those hardest hit by the pandemic work in the hospitality industry. Restaurants, bars, movie theaters, and live music venues with all concert tours being canceled. As Carolina Impact's Jason Terza shows us, for one husband and wife duo, not playing live meant not paying the bills. So they had to get creative. Hey y'all, my name is Sarah and this is my husband Austin and we are the band Chatham Rabbits from Chatham County, North Carolina. It's not something you see very often these days, especially not from a couple of 20-somethings, a husband and wife bluegrass banjo playing folk duo. I was a, a music teacher at the Montessori School of Durham and I taught K through eight music. I graduated with a degree in business and marketing and was a financial advisor for three years. Austin McCombie first laid eyes on Sarah Osborne six years ago while attending a show in Chapel Hill. I saw her on stage with her banjo and I was with my friend and I was like, I have got to talk to her. And my friend looked at me and he was like, you're never gonna talk to her. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right. After the show, Austin reached out to Sarah, but got a very generic email response. Several months later, he tried again. I was probably another six months after that, that I saw that her band was coming back to the Triangle and I was like, you know, what if we got coffee before the show? And she kind of reluctantly agreed <laughs> that she would meet me. And I was at a point in my life where I was like, what the heck, like I'll just go have coffee with this guy. And then coffee turned into pizza and pizza turned into a whole night of hanging out. I had to seal the deal really quick. So we got married a year later and then we've been married for five years. After things fizzled out with her previous band, Sarah and Austin together made the biggest decision of their lives to leave their real jobs behind and follow their musical passion. So it was just the perfect timing to, to do what we felt like we were honestly called to do. I called my dad and I was like, Dad, I'm starting a business. It's, um, it's a music business. And he's like, oh, okay, so you're really gonna be like a manager? I was like, well, I'm managing my own finances which I won't have because <laughs> I've decided to become a full-time musician. And that's how we became John Rabbits. We were just in this very pivotal moment in life and if we didn't take the chance to get out of our comfort zone and try playing music for a living, that we might lose the opportunity. And we just felt like that was scarier than staying in our jobs. Raised on country, bluegrass, folk, and blues music, Austin and Sarah turned their home into their office, writing and rehearsing. We just worked at like a nine to five. We'd wake up, you know, at 8 a.m., have our coffee, start hitting the phone, start, you know, working it just like a normal job. What a blessed peace, what a joy to find. As for the band's name, they didn't really choose it as much as it chose them. And there's a rich history with the rabbit in Chatham County. It was once the meat rabbit capital of the U.S., which is like totally bizarre. And there was actually a string band in the town, um, and they called themselves a Chatham Rabbit String Band. Well, then we find out that the guitar player for that string band lived in the house that we just bought. And so we just had to be called Chatham Rabbits. So instead of going to Nashville to try to make it big, Austin and Sarah began traveling the Carolinas in a 1986 Winnebago, playing small town theaters and festivals. So our first year of playing music, we played in churches, we played in baseball fields, we played in, you know, real proper theater venues, but also in backyards and porches. Won't you make them welcome the Chatham Rabbits, yo. Please, Supporting their debut album, Chatham Rabbits played more than 100 shows in 2018 and 19. So things were just on a real upward trajectory for us. Getting ready to release their second album and planning another big tour, 2020 was going to be their best year yet. We had a mandolin player and a bass player and some other musicians that we were working with and so our crew got bigger other than just the two of us, a sound guy and a manager at some points. Um, so we ended up looking for a new vehicle that could accommodate everybody to go on this big tour with our second album. And so we found this awesome deal on this awesome tour bus that was all the way out in California. So they went out west, bought a new RV, visited the mountains in Grand Canyon, even did some fly fishing. 
But just as they started making their way back home, the phone calls and emails started pouring in. COVID-19 was hitting the states really hard and venues were shutting down. And we're just like, oh my gosh, what did we do? We just bought this huge van. Our entire calendar of about eight months was just like wiped completely clean in about two weeks. Once home, they had time to regroup and think. Austin then had an idea. One thing led to another and we thought, what if we had a flatbed trailer as our stage and we could just pull it behind the van? And as soon as I thought of that, I was actually out at the campfire with a couple of buddies. Sarah was inside with a couple of our other friends and I literally ran from the campfire ran inside and I was like, Sarah, you have to hear this right now. I have this idea. So he came to me with this idea and was like, we're going to do a, you know, instead of a drive up concert, it's going to be essentially a drive through, but we're going to be the ones driving. So they got a trailer and then did a test run in Austin's parents' neighborhood. It was a huge success. We'll sit on the porch and rock and share, crack it open and find the crack. We were like, you know, if we get 20 people that want us to come to their neighborhood, we'll be thankful. And within a week, we had 400 submissions. Our inbox was just flooded with people desperate to hear live music. And I was like, OK, we can make this happen. Calling it the stay at home tour. Chatham Rabbits played nearly 90 live shows in 2020, but instead of playing festivals and theaters, it was mostly in neighborhoods. We've had people that I think wouldn't even like our style of music probably just come out with their lawn chairs and appreciate it just because no one's seen music in so long. We've only had the cops called on us one time for a noise complaint, but then the cops ended up, there were four cop cars and they all ended up staying and listening to our music and we didn't get a ticket. so consider it a success. Austin and Sarah are just elated to still be doing what they love, playing live music in front of actual people, especially under today's circumstances. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. What a fun idea. Can you imagine having a concert like that in your own neighborhood? Well, the Chatham Rabbits are from Chatham County. You know, we love to introduce you to area artists, and we have a special one for you tonight. Carolina Impact's Suzette Ree introduces us to a veteran artist and a college professor. There's the installation called the procession, majestic and tall, lining up along a pathway. It's colorful and eye-catching. There's another called the journey. The word and the art form certainly makes you think. The imagery of a person on a path of life. The creator and artist is sculptor Keith Bryant. My whole strategy for making work is to abstract it or make it a big enough step back that people can still insert themselves into the work without having to have all the backstory to understand it. Bryant is also a veteran educator. He's been a college art professor for some 30 years, first at Central Piedmont Community College, then UNC Charlotte. This is probably true for most educators, but seeing them start with a, not a very big knowledge base and then grow from there, you know, whether it's technically or aesthetically or hopefully both simultaneously. And that can be really exciting. But creating art has been his passion for more than three decades. A lot of hard work, uh, drive, a passion for making objects out of other objects or out of nothing, depending upon what material you're working with. We join Bryant at his studio, a converted garage. Some of my friends tease me about it being my man cave. Bryant's studio is full of tools. As a sculptor using different materials, he says he needs them all. Steel, obviously, it's welders and grinders, and I've got a plasma cutter. And with ceramics, I've got all the equipment that you'd have in a ceramic studio. So I'm kind of a tool junkie. I love tools. I don't go to one material. Like I don't always work in metal. I don't always work in wood. I don't always work in clay. I let the ideas tell me what I need to work in. One of his series represents emotions from words, like yield. How we have the inability to yield to each other's ideas or to you know, make space for others. You know, people that are, we disagree with or different than us, we sort of have gotten to that point where we, you know, we aren't willing to kind of do the give and take that makes things work. Another word, ripple. I like the notion of how there's a reaction to an action that keeps moving through time and space. And Brian also likes to work with what he calls found objects. This is a piece he calls idol. It's just an old, small, worn out broom head. It had some sort of resonance to me that sort of thinking about how we elevate sort of common 
objects and ideas and people to the status of being an idol. The evolution of an artist takes time, and Bryant is the first to admit he didn't always know this was his path. I didn't know when I got out of high school, I was sort of, you know, do I want, what do I want to do? You know, I was sort of at that point in my life where I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I actually ended up going to tech school and um, got a certificate for auto body paint. That didn't lead to a career, but Bryant says he learned how to work with metal. He eventually went on to college and even earned his master's in art. Bryant's art for several years was impacted by the loss of his wife to illness in 2013. She was a beloved painter herself. Working through his grief also led to this, called 365, a way to look at each day and see it. Here's a day that has potential. It's, it's a brand new day. There's, you know, history has not yet been written on this day. And so, you know, try to make the best out of it. Take, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that it presents. And, uh, you know, and then your life will be richer for that. When you spend time with Keith Bryant, so you can the, feel um, the teacher in him. He wants to impart so much more than what you can see. Creating the next opportunity is what drives him as an artist, and he believes you don't always have to have all the answers at once. That is part of the fun and part of the challenge, um, trying to figure out how to, how to make it all be cohesive. And this one, I think, is going to have more of a formal quality to it. Um, you know, some of my work is, is based on really strong emotions, but this might teach me something about some kind of emotion or idea that I don't, I'm not aware of just yet. And from that studio comes all this as the artist and teacher continues his journey. For Carolina Impact, I'm Suzette Reed reporting. Thanks so much, Suzette. Those outdoor installations can be seen at Central Piedmont Community College's Central Campus until June. You can also see Keith's complete collection online. Well, that's all we have time for this evening, my friends. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night. A production of PBS Charlotte.